people pray as broken hearts declare his praise but who can stop the lord almighty our god is the lion the lion of judah he's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him our god is find your way back to your seat. Well, good morning, everyone. Glad you are here today. Um, what an exciting time. I think many of you 
Lord willing, are going to stay for our, our wonderful picnic. You'll hear about that in a, in a couple of minutes here. We're just so excited about being able to come together to fellowship and, uh, and to be a part of what God is doing. Um, well, about a week ago, a little over a week ago, um, we had our Exalt. Um, for those who don't know, Exalt is a night of worship. It's very intentional, dynamic um, time where we can settle in, meditate. We spent some time in prayer. We spent some time reading God's word. We spent some time receiving communion together. A lot of wonderful things, as well as, of course, singing and lifting our voices to the Lord. Um, we had a, a wonderful turnout, great feedback. We'd love you uh, to join us next time. You'll hear about that. We do about once a quarter. So please, uh, next time it's on, we'd love to have you out. Um, it's about an hour, and it's just an incredible time together. So please come out for that. Um, we have a Hunter Sight-In coming up uh, in just a little bit here early next month. If you are a hunter, which I know we have a lot of hunters within our congregation, and specifically if you have friends who are hunters, uh, and, and when I say friends, we're, we're thinking the people that maybe you work with, your neighbors, your family members that are unchurched, meaning they don't go to a church, they have no outlet or no place where they can hear truth, hear the gospel, this is the place to bring them to. Um, you can just invite them. We have some cards, a little bit, little... Um, little business cards available. It's on our website, all the details. Um, it's sort of an open house concept. So you can come in any time during that day. There's going to be food provided and, uh, and some wonderful little handouts, I believe, as well, some things there. So please invite your friends. Get people to, to kind of hear, hear the truth and, and be a part of our church at the Hunter Site Inn. Also, that same weekend, we have our anniversary Sunday, which is November 7th. And on that Sunday, we're going to have our annual Thanksgiving dinner. We are so excited about this. Um, who doesn't love to eat? You notice I feel like I'm always talking about food up here. But food's a big part of community, big part of fellowship. And so we believe it's, it's important. Uh, so if you would like to be a part of our Thanksgiving dinner, you can register. We're, all of our registration's online um, for this, uh, different than previous years. So if you, if you want, you can go right to our website. You can register you and your family. It's a very small charge. I think it's $5 a person just to pay for the bigger amounts of food. And then you can also um, bring something for that as well. And all those details are there. Don't need to go into detail now. Uh, go on there. You can register and all the details are right online. Uh, last quick announcement. Um, our Discover series for October has moved online. So if you'd still like to be a part of our Discover series, just contact our church office and we'll give you all the details, get you connected with a special link to be able to watch and participate in that. So with all that, Pastor Ken. Well, good morning, everyone. Great to see you on such a beautiful fall day. It's awesome. If you're a guest with us, let me say welcome. You picked a great day to come to church because we have food after the service, right? Um, no, we, we would love for you to stick around if you're a guest and stick around for the picnic. Uh, we'll have enough food for everybody. Um, very excited about this opportunity. If you're a guest, help us get connected with you, though. If you would, just fill out that communication card. And anyone, if you have a prayer request or decisions that you've made, let us know about those things. And you can drop those communication cards in the giving boxes on your way out. Or, better yet, if you're a guest, take it to the Welcome Center. Uh, we'd love to put a gift into your hands and answer the questions that you might have about Southern Lakes Church. As you know, today is our picnic day. A month ago, we had this picnic scheduled, and I've shared from my heart how disappointed I was. But you know what it was? It was too hot of a day. That's what it was. It was just too hot. It was close to 90 degrees. People were going to bake. It was bad. You know, fall picnics supposed to be a little more brisk, right? And so we got low 60s, beautiful sunshine today. Couldn't ask for anything better. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. And so, yeah, amen. So I hope you'll stick around. Uh, and part of that is to just get to know some new people, right? We've got things for the kids to do. We've got bouncy houses. We've got games. We've got a bags tournament going on, punt, pass, and kick. We've got the Packers on the big screen watching them beat the Bears today. And, you know, if you're a Bears fan, that's okay. Stick around. We love you. You know, back, I always say the Packers have to play somebody, so you know how that is. But stick around. It's going to be a great time for our church family today. So glad that you're all here uh, with us for that. And, and last, uh, just yesterday, the ladies had an event, and it was kind of a missional event. It was called Show Love and Impact Your World, and uh, they put together a number of gift bags for the teachers and administrators over at Tibbet School here, just reaching out and putting a touch of love on our community, and what a great thing that was. So can we praise God for that event that happened yesterday? Amen. 
And one of the things Dawn shared with me is uh, one of the, the ladies that came to the event is, is very new to our church. And she said, this is a great way. She said, I thought I'd come because it's a great way just to meet some new people and to get to know people in the church. And I, and I love that mindset. I just love it. And, and I hope, again, is if you don't know a lot of people, stick around. It's a two-way street, right? Introduce yourself and get to know other people. But stick around for the picnic today. Even if you're a guest, first-time guest today, we got enough food. It's all good. You can have mine. I don't need it, okay? But we'll have, we'll have plenty, and I'm sure it'll be just a beautiful time together. We've got a lot to celebrate. God is good. Uh, as, we, as we think about giving today and the offering uh, together, I just want to remind you there are a number of different ways to give. Uh, you can give online. If you're watching online, welcome. So glad you can continue to join us that way. Uh, but please give online or give in person, whatever works best for you. Uh, we're chasing our budget by about $10,000 after last month. We kind of got hit hard with COVID last month and everything going on. So full disclosure there, remain faithful, okay? Just keep looking to God and allowing him to use you as you give your tithes and offerings. And remember, it's not about just paying the light bill and, and the staff and everything, but this uh, enables us to give the gospel to the ends of the globe. And uh, that's so important for what we're doing here. So thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your giving. Please uh, keep that up. God loves a cheerful giver. And so continue to give cheerfully as unto the Lord, and he will bless and multiply that. It all belongs to him anyways, right? Would you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you so much for a beautiful day today. Thank you that we have the opportunity to come here to worship you uh, with our, our voices, with our hearts open, our hands lifted to you, our tithes and offerings, our prayers time in the word, time of fellowship, all these things, Father, we, we just give them back to you in praise. You make them all possible. Thank you for meeting with us today, God. Thank you for corporate worship and the power of it. Thank you for this place where we can gather and assemble freely. Father, we love you. We worship you. We continue to do so from our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand as we continue to worship? No 
Father, we come to you today remembering that it is our life is in your hands. We hope that you are seen in our lives. Father, that you are magnified beyond anything that we do or we are. Your son is lifted up. Your creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry. Then from north to south,
Well, this, uh, this Sunday, you, uh, you have quite the honor and privilege to be hearing about Jesus' return. Uh, Jesus is coming back. Amen? Might not be in our lifetime. It could. It could. And you'll hear so much. But one thing I know is that right now, as we stand together as, as a congregation, as the church of Jesus Christ, we only see a little bit, you know, a, a, a dim scene a little bit about what it's going to be one day when we're standing face to face with Almighty God and His Son, Jesus Christ. The Lamb that was slain, the one given on our behalf, the sins of the world, we sang that right, the Lion and the Lamb. Who can stop Him? No one. And we have the opportunity to get a picture of that. Um, this is one of our favorite songs to lead. It's called Revelation Song taken from the book of Revelation, almost quote to quote. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. All creation sings of his glory. So as we sing this this morning, what you can in our, I know our human level and where we're at right now, picture what that will be like. What will you be thinking? It was that song I can only imagine, right? But what, what would you say? What would you want to tell your Savior? Thanksgiving, gratitude, maybe I'm sorry. You know, these are the things I know, you know, these are things that are going on. Because one day, it's, it's not going to be just dimly sit, sitting here wondering what that would actually be like. It's going to be. So as we sing this morning, think about what you're singing. Proclaim his holiness and his greatness with all creation, every nation, every tongue, and we proclaim his greatness. So let's sing together.
creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Jesus, one day we will stand before you. Whether it be today, whether it be a thousand years from now, we just don't know. But I pray that we would live our lives as if we're in that place. When everything we do, we magnify you. And everything we do, we scream, holy, holy, holy is you. Not about us. Not about our legacy, but about who you are. The Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, there's no one that compares. And we declare it with our lives. We love you and praise in Jesus' name. One of the beautiful things about uh, coming together to worship corporately is to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. We have the opportunity to do that today, and uh, so I want to help set the table a little bit by reading uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, beginning in verse number 23, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. One of the things that we're invited to do before we come uh, to the Lord's table is to examine ourselves. Uh, what that means is kind of like opening the door to your heart and taking a look in, see what's there. It's a little bit of introspection with the Holy Spirit's help. And, and what we're invited to do is to not make a mockery of the Lord's Supper, but to take it very seriously. It's a celebration, don't get me wrong, on the one hand. But on the other hand, it's something we have to take very serious and say, you know what? Jesus died for me. His broken body, he he. he bore the penalty, the shame for my sin that I could be forgiven. And, and we remember the gratitude that we have for what he did. And so part of that examination is to know whether or not we're in a right relationship with our Lord. Is everything right between us and the one who died for us? Are, are we living the way that we should be living? Or is there something that needs to be confessed and got right? And, and the beauty of of the Lord's table is it gives us a pattern or a routine, if you would, that on a regular basis we, we come and we can sort of hit the pause button and do a little introspection, examine ourselves. How's it going? How's your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, I know in our culture we're very uncomfortable with silence. Ever get in a car with somebody and you're driving along and you're like, okay, who's supposed to be talking here, you know? But silence is good. And we don't do it often enough. So we're just going to hit the pause button here. It's going to be uncomfortable for some of you, but I think good. And, and I'm just going to be quiet for about a minute and give you time to just talk to your Lord and Savior and make sure everything's all right. Do a little introspection. Hit that pause button. Examine yourselves before we come to the table. Let me just be quiet for a bit.
Father, thank you for being with us. You said where two or more are gathered in your name, you are there in the midst, and we know that you are here today. And you've asked us to memorialize your death and to celebrate that because of the salvation that we have. And so help us to do that today. Help us to remember your broken body and your shed blood and the symbols that bring us back to that place of the gospel, the good news. And Father, I pray that as we do so, our hearts would be in tune with you and your heart and that we'd be walking with you. Thank you for this time we can have together. Thank you for what you have done for us. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me just set the, uh, the table in the sense of how we do communion here. If you're a guest with us today or you're watching online, if you're watching online, you can just kind of hit the pause button, maybe go get some crackers and some juice, and you can partake with us as well. But we invite you, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, and you know what this is all about, to come. And uh, we've got four stations around the room, and if you're in the back quadrant there, go to that one, and back there, up here in the front quadrant, come up here and... And just go off to the sides and, and, and uh, just file back around to the main aisles and back to your seats till everybody is served. That would be great. Um, once everybody is served, we'll partake of the elements together. And let me remind you, it's a double cup. So there's both the bread and the juice together. So take that double cup and, uh, and then hold on to those and we'll partake of those together. So let me ask you to come at this time and when everybody is served, we'll partake of the elements together. The Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus, on the night which he was betrayed, took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And he said, eat this. As often as you do, do it in remembrance of me. Let us eat together. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, thank you is just not enough, <clears throat> and yet we give you praise today, as best we know how, for what you have done for us. Help us to remember, help us to live that good news every day and share it with others, and help us to remember what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. You can set those cups aside uh, till after the service, but let me call your attention to part of what we just read in the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, it says this, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. You see, every time we have the Lord's Supper, and the Lord has told us to do this, this is a rhythm, it's a practice, it's an ordinance. Every time we do, we're making a proclamation that not only did Jesus come to this earth and die and rise again, but he is coming back again. That's the proclamation that we make. Do you believe that? Do you believe Jesus is coming again? Let me ask you, are you ready? Are you ready for when Jesus comes back, right? We need to be, right? We need to be because these are crazy times in which we live. I mean, you think about what's going on in the world right now, and I know there's been other crazy times in history, but you think of the natural disasters that are going on all around the globe. Hurricanes and earthquakes and tornadoes and flooding, unprecedented flooding and wildfires and, and just crazy things happening around the world. Uh, it's a time of war, and I know there's been many other times of war as well, but uh, right now our inner cities are places of war. There's many people killing one another. There are people that are actually strapping explosives to their bodies and going in places like mosques for the express purpose of blowing a whole bunch of people up along with themselves. Uh, there are cyber wars. There are, there are economic wars. There are star wars. There's just all this craziness happening. 
And, and we're living in the midst of a pandemic, right? Vaccinations. Uh, what's the latest variant coming down the pike? How many of you lived through a pandemic before? You know, unprecedented times. And, and we don't know what's, what's coming next. We have Ebola, we have malaria, we have cancer. What's the next thing that's going to happen? It's happening. And then you just look at the state of mankind and people are angry and they're frustrated and they're depressed and they're sinful. Which is said, the Lord has said is all part of the indication of the end times. So I don't know if you believe it or not, but we are living in the end times. And there's a lot of chaos happening in our world. And so uh, we, we want to talk about that in our new series. we got a new series coming up uh, over the next month here. And no, it's not about uh, the glorious return. It's not about Brady going back to, you know, play the Patriots. You know, they made such a big deal out of that, right? And I was thinking about that. Man, i got a new series coming up. No, that's not it. Have you ever wondered about, you know, is Jesus really coming back? When, when does that happen? What is that like? I mean, I've heard things about the rapture and the millennium and the great tribulation and the 144,000 witnesses and the, the, the mark of the beast and the 666. I mean, what is all this stuff? Well, we're going to dig into some of that and uh, lay a foundation for you in all those areas uh, for that. Uh, the title for this series is actually taken from our doctrinal statement, uh, which reads like this. We believe in the personal, bodily, and glorious return of our Lord Jesus Christ. The coming of Christ at a time known only to God demands constant expectancy and, as our blessed hope, motivates the believer to godly living, sacrificial service, and energetic mission. I was going to preach a different series during this time on the Holy Spirit, and I just felt like God wanted me to step back to this because of all that was going on in the world and the fact that we need to step into our blessed hope. We need to be ready. We need to have an expectancy. That's what gives us the hope. That's what gives us the motivation. That's what gives us the focus that we need to go on. And so that's where God wants us to be over this next month. And hopefully, it'll help you. It'll help you to sort some of these things out in the end times and what's going to happen when and so forth. But I want it to be more than that. I, I want it also to heighten your awareness that we are ready, that Jesus is coming back, and it could be today. We need to be a people that are ready. So join me, if you would, in Acts chapter 1, where we're going to start there. We're going to start where where Jesus left the earth. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. And as you're turning there, let me just say a couple things. And the first one is this. No matter where you are at in your spiritual walk, this series is for you. You may know a lot about the Bible. You may know very little about the Bible. You may know a ton about the end times. It may be your favorite topic, and you've read and read and read and know so much, and you can just quote things backwards and forwards. That's great. Wherever you are in your spiritual journey and where you're at on these topic of end times things, I hope that you'll take the next steps and grow and step into that in a greater way. Uh, I hope it'll be that way for you. Uh, the other thing I want to say uh, is this, that my purpose is not just to fill your head, though, with a bunch of facts, and here's what's going to happen when, and all the details, and the tribulation, all that stuff. Uh, my goal is, is not to teach a, uh, an in-depth class of eschatology on the master's level of seminary. That's not it at all. There's a, there's a time and a place for that. But my goal is more to feed your heart and to stir you up. And so if I do that, by the grace of God, then my purpose has been fulfilled. Acts chapter 1 picks up uh, in the early church after Jesus uh, walked this earth and ascended into heaven. Beginning in verse number 1, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to both do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them uh, during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And so after Jesus rose from the dead, uh, he had a glorified body. He went right through doors, 
but he ate food. It was just phenomenal. He would appear and he would disappear. Uh, they could recognize him. They could see him. He had its glorified body. And for 40 days, he walked this earth and he showed himself to his followers, which, is, which really invigorated them. And, and then the, the 11 disciples went out and turned the world upside down because they saw the risen Lord Jesus Christ. We go on, verse number four, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And we know that was the day of Pentecost. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Now, this is interesting. He says, okay, it's not for you to know the time. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. Nobody really knows the time or the seasons. But he gave them a commandment. He told them what to do. Uh, we're to occupy till he comes. And look at verse number eight. He said, but you shall receive power. That's the Holy Spirit power. Uh, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So starting in their own little area, Jerusalem, their own backyard, they were to be witnesses of him, to tell other people about Jesus. And then spread out from there and out from there to the ends of the earth. And of course, they obeyed that command. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Let me read that again. The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus went to heaven. How does this story end in the end? Well, you can jump all the way to the end of the book of Revelation and read the last two verses, and this is what it says. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Say that with me. I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And so a, a constant theme throughout the scriptures in the New Testament and the believers in the early church, they were, they were looking with this amazing expectancy like today could be the day Jesus could come back. Am I ready? Because he said he's coming back quickly. Uh, this whole area is called the study of last things. Eschatology. Uh, that word comes from the Greek word eschatos, which means last, so it's the study of last things. And so the study of last things is from the church age, which we are in right now, all the way to the end of, of time, when there's a, a new heaven and a new earth, and we live for all eternity with Jesus. That's the study of last things. Eschatology is what we're going to be studying all of this. And, and again, I don't know where you guys are at in terms of your, your previous eschatological adventures and how much you know and you don't know and all the rest of that stuff. And so I want to start out today. Today's going to be a little bit more cerebral. We're going to get into some more practical stuff along the way. But I want to start out with an overview, kind of a snapshot. What happens uh, maybe you could lay this out, maybe you couldn't, and, uh, and so I, I just want to take us there and, and look at some of these things. So let's start out in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 uh, with the rapture, because I believe the rapture is the very next thing that's going to happen on the prophetic calendar. As, as we get ready, I believe it could happen right now. And, and by the way, as you're turning there, uh, I just want to say this to a little bit of a disclaimer, all right? Uh, you might see end-time theology a little bit different than I do, okay? Uh, you might be amillennial, or you might be pre-tribulational or post-tribulational rapture, and some of you just got lost right now. We're going to explain all those terms. But you maybe think you got it all figured out. But I just want you to know that when it happens, and when we go to heaven, you'll know I was right. <laughs> Actually, what it'll, it'll probably be is I'll find out you were right or somebody else was right. Some of this is a mystery. We've got to have a lot of humility in this. 
But just because it's a mystery and maybe we don't have it all worked out doesn't mean we shouldn't study it, doesn't mean we should, shouldn't have an opinion, doesn't mean we shouldn't have some beliefs. And so uh, I have the platform, so I'm sharing with you my beliefs at this point in my life. And if you want to talk more about this, I'll be glad to talk to you more about it. But we're not going to make it a point of division. That's not what it's about, okay? It's a point of unity. We can all agree that Jesus is coming back. And so I'm going to lay some things out here. And I believe the next thing on the prophetic calendar, and it could happen right now before I even get done with this sermon, is the rapture. What is the rapture? Well, it means to be caught up, and we're going to spend more time on the rapture next week, so please come back. Beginning in verse number 13 of 1 Thessalonians 4. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Boy, that's really an important verse right there, isn't it? You know, this is all about hope. When you, when you know Jesus Christ and you know what's going on, you're secure in him, you have hope. And when you don't have hope in Jesus, you, you sorrow. I, I've been to funerals where people are, are sorrowing because they don't know Jesus. There is nothing else. It's all meaningless. You know, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die and there's nothing else. Well, there is something else, and we're going to lay that all out. But it begins with the rapture. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Sleep is a metaphor for death right there. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Oh, what a huge comfort these should be that, that at any moment... We're out of here, no matter how bad things go. Uh, I believe that's part of the rapture, that God is going to rapture his church, the true believers, out of this world before the impending judgment of the tribulation comes. Uh, we see this uh, through scripture, happens over and over again. Think about Noah and his family. They were the righteous ones, and so God preserved them, but he destroyed the rest of the world. God is going to rapture, he's going to take his saints up out of this world. It's going to be a crazy time. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 uh, says like this, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at that last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. I don't know about you, but wouldn't it be cool to be part of the generation that gets to go up in the rapture? Okay, it might be a little bit of pride. There won't be any pride in heaven, so I don't think we're going to be there going, hey, man, I was part of the raptured crowd, you know. But it'd be pretty awesome, right? In the blink of an eye, we're going to be out of here. I mean, the twinkle, I mean, it's in a, in a moment. And, and it, it's going to be crazy, right? Uh, there's going to be a believer and an unbeliever that may be married, and one of them's going to wake up in the morning, and the other one's going to be gone. They're going to go around the house, and the house is going to be empty. Uh, there's going to be cataclysmic events happening, and there'll be people that are driving cars or flying airplanes, and when this happens, if they're believers, they're gone. Good luck. It's crazy. I mean, if you come here on a Sunday morning and there's nobody here, it's probably time change Sunday. <laughs> you got that wrong. By the way, that's November 7th. Mark it on your calendar. Or the rapture took place. You don't want to be left behind. If you know Jesus, you're out of here. You're raptured. You go to be with the Lord forever. And I believe then, as the believers are taken out of this world, then all this craziness happens that kicks off the seven years of tribulation, which is the next thing we see here. Ushers in this time of great tribulation as the world has never seen. Revelation chapter 6 all the way through 18 deal with this. So let's go ahead and read that together right now. Now we'll be here for a while, won't we? So I'm going to give you that as homework, okay? Read the book of Revelation. It's all there. I'm not making this stuff up. 
But, but let me just kind of hit some of the, the highlights. What happens during this tribulation? It's a period of seven years where this is going to be this judgment of God on the earth. It's called the great tribulation because the things that happen are just unprecedented. It's great. It's monumental. It's huge. It's also known as the 70th week of Daniel. Uh, Daniel chapter 9 deals with this, just verse 27, uh, I'll read that. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of, of abominations he shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. And if you don't know anything about prophecy right now, you're going, oh, yeah, yeah, what is that all about, right? Well, I'm going to explain more about the 70th week of Daniel in a, in a future message, but this is referring to the great tribulation. We are in the church age right now, but eventually is going to be this great tribulation as known as the 70th week of Daniel. And many things happen during this time. Like um, there, are, there are judgments, and the book of uh, Revelation is outlined this way. Uh, it begins with the seven seals, Revelation 6 through 8.1. And during the seven seals time there and these judgment of the seven seals, the Antichrist comes... Uh, there are wars that happen on this, on this earth. There are economic woes like we've never seen before. You know, we talk about inflation. No, this is just totally different than that. Hunger, death, earthquakes as never seen before. There's going to be the sealing of the 144,000 of the children of Israel, the witnesses that are part of that time. You can read about it there. And then at the end of that is going to be the seventh seal. The seventh seal gets opened, and it's amazing. There are 30 minutes of complete silence in heaven. It's just almost as there's this take a deep breath because what's coming is going to be a lot worse. And it is. And it ratchets up to the seven trumpets. Revelation 8, 2 through 15, 8. Hail and fire is going to come. A third of the, uh, the sea becomes as blood. A star called Wormwood falls from the sky and pollutes a third of the world's water supply. There's going to be locusts, there's going to be plagues, and so much more that come out of there. And again, I'm not reading these for sake of time today, but you can go back. Followed by the seven bowl judgments, Revelation 16, uh, verses 1 through 21, all of 16 talks about this. Loathsome sores that, that people are going to have that are just going to eat away at them. Uh, all the water there is going to be turned to blood. Um, there's, there's going to be scorching heat. That's just going to burn people up. Earthquakes. There's going to be hail falling. And the and book of Revelation tells us about this hail. There are going to be 75-pound hailstones. I mean, you think golf ball size hail is something. I mean, I, I, just for fun of it, I Googled. It's like, what weighs 75 pounds? I was trying to get like a connection point. And, and it's really funny. Go ahead and do that. They got all these things like a small sofa and, you know, dresser and a bookshelf and all this stuff. But what I thought was really interesting, 75 pounds is like a small chest freezer is what they said. Uh, or like your dryer, okay? And, and so can you imagine that falling out of the sky but in the form of hail and crushing people and everything on the earth. I mean, it's going to be insane. Uh, the battle of Armageddon happens here. Revelation chapter 16, verses 12 through 16. And I put a lot of these in your notes so you can go back and, and talk about this in your small group this week as you have time. Read some of these passages. Followed by the fall of Babylon the Great, Revelations chapter 17 and 18, right there. And then the final coming of the Lord. Now, this coming of the Lord is different, and let me just explain it really quickly. Uh, the Lord is coming back, but it's kind of like a twofold, if you would. And, and so he's coming back at the rapture, but he doesn't come all the way to this earth. Uh, he's just coming in the clouds, and we're caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we're forever with the, with the Lord. But at the end of this uh, tribulation, the Lord is coming back. Again, this is called the second coming of Christ, technically you got the rapture, and you've got the second coming of Christ where he comes. And that's followed by the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 9. And that sets up the stage for what comes next, which is a literal thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on this earth. That's the millennial reign of Jesus, Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. 
Uh, Satan is bound during that time. There's going to be peace on the earth. And the primary purpose of this thousand-year reign is so that God can fulfill his promises to the nation Israel. There are other promises that are yet unfulfilled, and they'll be fulfilled during this time, this millennial reign of Jesus on this earth. Um, After that is the final rebellion and judgment. Satan is released. Uh, He was bound during the millennium, but he's released for a short time, and he raises havoc on the earth, and he brings together uh, an army, and it's the battle of Gog and Magog. But good news, guess who wins? It's not Satan. And Satan is cast into the bottomless pit where he is forever and ever and ever suffering at that point. Satan loses. But there's also what's called the great white throne judgment that happens uh, at the end of this. Um, And I I just want to read that for you. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one, according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Let me just pause there for a moment, okay? The first death is when you die physically. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, this is a second death, okay? Believers don't go through a second death. You die once, and then you live for all eternity. And that's why the next verse is very important, verse 15. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is serious stuff, folks. I'm not making this up. You have to think about it. I'm not here to guilt anybody. I'm not here to scare anybody. But I want to tell you the truth. And the truth is, there's coming a day when we will all stand before Jesus. For the believer, it's not going to be the great white throne. It'll be the judgment seat of Christ. We'll talk about that in another sermon. For the unbeliever, it's the great great white throne judgment where you're going to stand before God. And he's going to basically look in the book, the Lamb's book of life. And if your name is not found there, which it won't be if you don't know Jesus, you'll be cast into the lake of fire where Satan is and all of his demons for all eternity. And no, this isn't the place where you're going to be partying and having all kinds of fun with all your friends. That's not what it is. It should really make you think because you don't want to go there. And it should make all of us think because we don't want anybody to go there. I don't want you to go there. In fact, I don't want you to go there, and that's why I'm telling you the truth right now. Because I can't do it for you, but you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus came to this earth the first time, and he died on the cross for you to pay the penalty for your sins so that you could be forgiven, and your name could be written in the Lamb's book of life. My friend, is your name written in the book? Because if it's not then there is hell to pay, literally. I don't want you to go there. I don't want anybody to go there. That's what this is all about. This is the great white throne judgment. But thankfully, it's followed by this eternal state for those, this is the good news side of it, those who know Jesus. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Let me just read a little part of that too. Revelation 21, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, 
nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. I don't know about you, but I look forward to that time. No more death, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more crying. There's coming a time when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to put it all back together. He's going to destroy this earth. It's all going to be burned up with a fervent heat, Peter tells us. There's going to be nothing left. He's going to start over anew and afresh, and there's going to be an entirely new earth, which is going to be heaven, a new Jerusalem. And those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ that have humbled ourselves and received what he has done for us, we get to live for, with him for all eternity in heaven. But those who don't have their name written in the book of life are lost for all eternity. So that's a bit of an overview. That's, and then it's eternity, 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 and I don't know what we do all that time, but it's going to be fantastic. I know it is. Okay. Your homework is to read it, okay? There's an awful lot there. And you'll be like, eh, I don't know about that. And go ahead and read it. See what you think. I'll be circling back and talking some more about this in the future weeks. But my time is short today, so let me just cover a couple more things and I'll be done. Back to our doctrinal statement. Our doctrinal statement uh, has four things about the coming of Christ and then three practical application points as well in it. We believe in the personal, bodily, and glorious return at a time known only to God. Those are the four things. We'll cover those in a second. And then the three practical things is constant expectancy, a blessed hope, and godly living, sacrificial service, and energetic mission, this whole motivation to live right at the end. We're going to be saying more about this as time comes uh, in the future. Uh, but let me just cover those, those points real quickly. First of all, it's going to be a personal return. Jesus personally is going to come back just as he came the first time. He's coming again. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven. It's Jesus himself, he's coming. Just like he came at Christmas, we celebrate Christmas, he's coming again personally. Uh, John 14, 3, I will come again and receive you, he said to myself, that where I am there you may be also. That's what he told his followers, his disciples. So it's going to be a personal return. It's also going to be a bodily return. Jesus comes back in bodily form. Remember, just as you saw him go up into heaven in that glorified body, he's coming back again. And some false teachers would, would deny this. They said he's already come. He's come spiritually and, uh, you know, you missed him. And, and, you know, oh, I'm Christ and you're Christ. And no, that's not how it works. He's coming back bodily. He's going to have a glorified body and, and uh, he's going to, Catch us up in the rapture, and we're going to have transformed bodies just like him. We're going to see him as he is. Acts chapter 1, verse 11. The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Some of you are like, man, I am ready to trade this model in. I am. I was thinking there, I was just worshiping God this morning, and, and I, like I got a shin splint on my left leg, and I'm coughing, and I'm like, man, I must be getting old. What's going on here? And uh, one day, we get to turn these in. I mean, if it's today, I get a new body today, which would be awesome, right? It's going to be a bodily return, and then it's going to be a glorious return. Uh, let me just explain something to you here for those of you who may not be aware of this. Uh, our doctrinal statement is the same as about 1,500 other churches. Uh, it's called the Evangelical Fellowship of Churches in America, EFCA, okay? And uh, we combine together, we're completely autonomous churches. Uh, we have our own form of government, and we make our own decisions and decide how we're going to spend our money and do things. But we, we're interdependent in the sense that we... we joyfully join together to do greater works for the gospel. And it's been awesome. It's been awesome to be part of this network of churches, and, and I just can't say much enough about the EFCA. But there's a common doctrinal statement which really binds us together, and that's where our doctrinal statement comes from as well. But one of the things I want to explain to you is in that doctrinal statement, uh, it used to say, I think about two and a half years ago this was changed, it used to say the premillennial return not glorious return. 
because the predominant belief uh, for many, many years in the EFCA was that it was going to be a pre-millennial return of Christ. And so most of the churches still believe that way. I personally believe that way. Many of you believe that way. But they changed it to a glorious return for the sake of unity. It's like, hey, we're not going to split hairs over whether or not, you know, he comes be, you know, pre-millennial or post-millennial or, or whatever's going to happen right there. And so it's for the sake of unity. And I just wanted to explain that because the doctrinal statement did change from when this church was founded and all the rest that went with that. But it's going to be a glorious return. Uh, Matthew 24 and verse 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heaven and that all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And so whenever it is, however it is, it's going to be glorious that he returns. Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And one more thing is that it's going to be an imminent return. And what that means is it could happen at any moment. It's imminent. Nothing else has to be fulfilled. I don't believe there's any other prophecy that has to be fulfilled. Uh, Jesus could come back at any moment. Now, again, that's my personal view. That's not contained in our doctrinal statement. Our, our doctrinal statement just simply says it could occur at any time. Um, and, and it's at a time known only by God. Um, I said that wrong. Let me clarify. Okay. I'm saying it could only it could occur at any time. Our doctrinal statement says at a time known only by God. Okay? I believe it's imminent. You may not believe it's imminent. You may believe something else has to happen before it, you know, before it comes and the rapture may not be the next thing on the prophetic calendar and so forth. I'm just telling you, again, what I believe about all that. But the bottom line is nobody knows the exact time. We can agree that he's coming, but nobody knows exactly when. Matthew 24 and verse 33. 36, that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And if somebody's telling you, you know, they know the date, and he's coming back, at a, run, okay? There's been many date setters, and they've all been wrong, because nobody knows the day or the time. He's coming back anytime. Now, I was hoping we'd have a little bit more time for practical application, but if you're like me, you want to have a picnic and you want to see the Packer game and all that good stuff. And uh, you know what? If the Lord doesn't come back, we can come back next Sunday and talk about this stuff. If, if he does, then, you know. So let me just give you the fill in the blanks at least, and I'll talk more about this next week. We need to be hearers of the word, not doers only, so be ready. That's the constant expectancy. Be ready. Number two, be hope-filled. That's that blessed hope. It should give us encouragement to be talking and, and dreaming about these things. And number three, be working. Uh, we should be motivated to godly living, sacrificial service, and being on mission. Remember, what did Jesus say right before he went into heaven? Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every living creature. We're to be on mission. As long as we're here, we're to occupy till he comes. We're to be watching. We're to be ready. But we need to be loving God. We need to be loving people. We need to be making disciples. Because here's the thing. At the end of the day, the only thing that you can take to heaven with you is what? The souls of others that you have led to Jesus. That you've had a part in them coming to know Jesus. You can't take your car. You can't take your 401k. You can't take your house. You can't take your business. But those who know Jesus, their name can be written in the Lamb's book of life. Are you ready? It could be today. What if it is? <laughs> Jesus said it this way, Revelation 22. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am. Another I am statement. I am coming, say the last word with me, quickly. Quickly. Are you ready? Are you hope filled? Are you working? The night is coming when no man can work. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. You've given us so much to go on. There's so much we don't understand. Maybe it's because we can't understand it. But we know that you're coming back and it's going to be a glorious return. Help us to be watching and ready. Help us to be busy building your kingdom 
Help us to be thinking about those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. And I pray even now for those, Father, that might be hearing my voice today and are being challenged by these words. I pray that they wouldn't put this off, but they would receive you. If they got questions, that they would look into it, not just blow it off. Help us all, Father, to be found in you so that when you come, we can be together with you for all eternity. Thank you for your love, God. Thank you for the blessed hope that we have in Jesus. And all God's people together said, amen. 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 We just read this in the book of Matthew. You can stand. Uh, he's coming on the clouds. And everyone, kings, king, kings of this world, people that, that have not even turned to him will bow. But we are his people, right? And we rejoice in that day. So let's declare this and sing this together. He's coming on the clouds. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. Every chain will break. And every chain will break. As broken hearts declare His praise. But who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the light. The light of Judah. He's roaring. Ten minutes here. There's going to be food provided at about noon, so you got a little bit of social time, and then there's going to be a ton of fun uh, out in the uh, out in the backyard over there in the, the patio. So stick around, get all the info, and have a wonderful time. God bless. <laughs>